Hey, good morning, everybody. I am Asia Baines. I am a recent graduate of Wichita State University, and I will be presenting on my research that I've been conducting with Dr. Nick Salome in the physics department on estimating the amount of neutrinos that we should expect to come to Earth from the galactic core, aka the middle of our galaxy. So this is just a slight overview of everything we're going to be talking about today. So we're going to start off with our background and my purpose and then going into my original attempts, which are my mathematical attempts I had first started when I started this project. And then we're going to go into my model simulated with my linear and randomized model and then why I decided to go with modeling instead of continuing with my mathematical attempts. And then my results I got from my modeling and then my conclusion. So this is just a slight preview or just a background of what I thought would be important as we go through this presentation. And so I have three points that I feel like would be important to know. And the first one is Sagittarius A. So Sagittarius A is a massive black hole in the middle of our galaxy, and it is located about 25,800 light years away, and is about 4 million, 4 million times the mass of our sun. And the reason why this is important is because this is going to be the general region that I'm going to be studying my um, neutrinos, and where I will also be placing my accretion disk. So accretion disks are circumstellar disks that consist of mainly the material of it which it is orbiting about. And so this is gonna be where all my high energy events are gonna take place and where I'll be getting the majority of my neutrinos from. And then so the Crab Nebula is going to be my standard candle, AKA my reference for the majority of my accretion disk. And I'll touch more on that as I get into my modeling. And then so the most important part of this presentation are my neutrinos. And so neutrinos are subatomic particles that have a non-zero mass that rarely interact with normal matter, and they also travel near the speed of light. And so the fact that they hardly interact with normal matter is actually very important in this presentation because this will allow us to make the assumptions that we do of the fact that a neutrino, as it, as it leaves the accretion disk within the galactic core, it will come straight from there to here. And so it does allow us to make that assumption as I go into my modeling and making my distances. And so this is just a little visualization of what I wanted to provide you guys with just what an accretion disk looks like. And so the orange is the accretion disk, and this is gonna look a lot different if it was a star and because of gravitational lensing, and this is with a black hole. And so I just wanted to provide a little bit of visualization of what exactly we're gonna be looking at. And so that's that. And so going to my purpose, so the purpose of my research is to, as I said before, to find the overall neutrino flux of the, of the accretions within the galactic core. And so I had done this through two different types of attempts, I guess, more of like mathematical um, attempts and then my modeling. And then this in general can just provide us with a lot of, just an approximation of how many neutrinos we should actually expect to come from the galactic region to here. And also it will provide us with just a lot of information of just like the characteristics of the galactic region and like what actually, what, what events could be occurring there and just, just give us more information on the environment. So going into my original attempts, so when I first started this research project, if I'm being quite honest, I had no idea where to go. And so I had done a lot of literature review as everybody else does. And I had come up with a, I had seen a lot of equations that I could potentially use in my own study. And so I had multiple equations, but these are the three that I wanted to highlight. And so these are just the equations I had used. I'm not gonna go into a lot of depth of what each variable means, but I just wanted to show you guys these equations that I had, did not end up using, but used. And then so I had reached a lot of, I guess in a sense, issues of with these equations. So the first equation, I had an undefined Q, and I actually had reached out to the author of this paper to ask for a question, but I did not get a response. So me and the grad student that I had worked with, we had assumed that this is going to be the binding energies of all the elements within the secretion disk. And so this had eventually made it more comp complex than what we had intended it to be because it required the knowledge of all the binding energies and energies of all the elements with this accretion disk and also had required us to assume what elements would be in this accretion disk as well. And so it just involved, it just became very complex very fast. And so we ended up moving on from this equation. And then we ended up going on to the second equation that I had showed before. And this is actually from the same author. It was just a much more updated version of the first equation. And then this one also, or this one did not involve binding energies, but it did involve a constantly changing temperature and energy. And so this also just became a very complex model. And then we ended up just moving on from that as well. And then my third model, or my third equation that I had used was actually very promising. It had involved a lot of constants and like, it was actually going to be a more doable model that I could create. 
And so this one, however, after we did unit analysis, it resulted in not units of flux. And then so we had just hit a wall and then we had, oh, there it goes, okay. So we had hit a wall and we were just like wondering what else could we possibly do to make this model or just to create, to find the neutrino flux of the galactic center or galactic core. And so it was just up in the air at the moment. And then me and the grad student I was working with, we had decided to just simulate what the galactic region should look like with these accretion disks. And so we had come up with two models. So the two models are the linear model and my randomized model. So my linear model, as the name signifies, it kind of, it's just a linear model of all my accretionists on a line. And then my randomized model is just randomizing my placements, my accretion disk placements, and my accretion disk sizes. And so this is just visualizations that my, one of my grad, the grad students I was working with had provided for me, so that was just very kind. And then so these are my two models I created, and then I wanted to touch on what exactly am I looking for, and so, so this line right here, as you can see in the pink, that is going to be my ideal range for my neutrino flux that I want, because this is from neutrinos from an AGN, which is an active galactic nuclei. And the only issue with this is that the Sagittarius A is not AGN, it's actually relatively dormant. And so we were looking for a flux relatively close to this negative 16, this range of negative 10 to the negative 16 to 10 to the negative 28. And so that was the range that I wanted to hit as I was doing this modeling. And relatively, maybe a little bit higher because it's not an active galactic nuclei, but around that range. So to begin with my modeling, so I had started with my linear model, and this was just going to be the easier model to start off with when, since I was learning how to code during this time as well. And so I did this all in MATLAB, and this had relied predominantly on the sizes of the accretion disk, the distances, and the quantities of it. So I had assumed that there's gonna be 5,400 accretion disks. And then so I had taken these accretion disks and placed them on a line, on a line, and due to just gravity in general, they were more bunched towards Sagittarius A because of gravity, and then as it became further out, it just became more sparse. So that was the model that we had created, and then since they were all in a line, it was all gonna be symmetric on, or the, the same on both sides of the galactic core, and so we just did it focused on, we just focused on one half of the side, and then we just multiplied the flux in the end because of symmetry. And then so the crab nebula becomes important in this part because all the accretionists I had assumed in this model were all going to be the exact same size and have the exact same flux as the Crab Nebula. And so these are all just the same, these are all just the Crab Nebulas on a line. And then I had used that to then find the distances and scale each one to the Crab Nebula. And so this had provided me with a flux of, I'm not gonna say it because it's really high. And so this was just a, not a very good model. And then so this just brought up the question after I was done with it was how can I make this more realistic and more like what the actual environments of the galactic core will be like. And then so that's when my randomized model comes in. And then I had done this in C++, all in C++, and then this involved just, like I said before, randomizing the accretion displacements and the accretion disk sizes. So for the accretion displacements, I had a code that would provide me with a random coordinates within the two to three kiloparsec, which is about 10 quadrillion miles in length for the galactic region. And so I had them randomize it within this two to three kiloparsec range. And then I also had a, so I just got X, Y, Z coordinates for that. And then for my, um, for my radius, I had just had them randomize it from zero to 10 light days. So zero being no accretion just at all to 10 light days in length. And then, so I had done that. And then I had calculated distances to each of these um, accretion disk also taking into account that since when I had randomized within this bubble of two to three kiloparsecs, I had only done that in reference to the galactic core. And so I had to take the distance to that as well in account to my distance here with just overall from to earth. And so the earth I had assumed were gonna be the origin coordinates of zero, zero, zero. And then so I was able to calculate the distance from here to the accretion disk. And then I also took account, or I also scaled this to the Crab Nebula along with my radius. And then so that then provided me with a result of 7.36 times 10 to the negative 11. So as I said before, we were going for something from 10 to the negative 16 to 10 to the negative 28. And so obviously I am five magnitudes off of what I had desired it to be. And then to me and my mentor, we had come up with four potential reasons as to why this didn't really work out the way that we wanted it to. And then so the first being that the Crab Nebula was probably not the best Terran candle to use throughout this presentation. And then the second one being that there are actually fewer accretion disks within the galactic core than we actually expected it to be. So if there were less accretion disks, then obviously the flux would also decrease. And then so the third one is that the accretion disk randomly distributed 
oh, sorry, totally did not mean to say that. But um, it's actually rarer to produce larger accretion disks than smaller ones. And so taking into account the probability of ha having a larger accretion disk and then the probability of having smaller accretion disks could be a good next study for this presentation. And then also it is, this is the fourth point is actually the most interesting one is that we don't know if like more stars or black holes or dark matter could actually interact with and stop neutrinos. And so that is another interesting future study that could happen. But if that were true, then that could, some, that could be something that a future study could take into account and estimate and recalculate this neutrino flux. And then so in conclusion, Studying the neutrino, uh, the ultra neutrinos from the galactic core will just inform us of the probability of actually getting a galactic neutrino on Earth. And so this will also just expand our knowledge, like I said before, of like what the environment is of the galactic core, depending on the energies that we receive. And then also it'll just provide us with a more recent analysis of the galactic core's environments because the fact that because of the due to the fact that neutrinos travel at the speed of light. And so granted, it won't be recent like now, but like it will be relatively recent in space terms. And so these are my references. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? So I've actually had to do a little bit of reading about neutrinos recently for my own personal job. So I just want to know like how you got into this research topic and you did a good job translating it into English. What was the hardest oh, cool. part of translating it for an audience? Oh, well, that it was rough if I'm being quite honest. So I got into this research project. It's actually a really funny story. So I was actually eating lunch in the physics department and I had run into Dr. Nick Solomon because he was also eating lunch there. And he asked me if I wanted to do research. And I was like, yeah, sure. And then I got into this project. So I didn't know what a neutrino was until I took, until I started doing research with, research with him. And so, but eventually I started understanding more of like why it's important and like why this research is actually becoming a thing and like neutrino physics. And so it's just pretty cool to like see the applications that this could possibly have. But um, how I translated this to English, if I'm being quite honest, this was a lot of work. <laughs> um, I definitely struggled with just putting in things that I just did. Normally when I talk to people, they understand like, I guess, space jargon, I guess is the word. And so it's like, normally it's just how I communicate since I work with physics. Like I work with Dr. Solomon, and I also work with the grad students. So they understand what I'm saying. So translating it was definitely a lot of work, but I ended up doing it eventually. So it's all good. I knew I was gonna get a question from you. <laughs> I want you to know that it was a pleasure to hear you do the presentation because you were so excited about it that it made me excited about it. I know nothing about space, but I enjoyed learning about the experience based on the way you presented it. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'm actually happy about that because I worked really hard on practicing my presentation skills. So. <laughs> Is the purpose of a neutrino coming to Earth just the fact that it doesn't ever usually interact with matter and so it coming to Earth is interacting with matter or is there a different reason why it's uh, important that we study why it's coming to Earth or if it does? So are you asking, I'm sorry, I, I, can you repeat that, I guess? DLDR, why do we care if they come here? Oh, okay. So honestly, the reason why we care is because, like I said, it would just honestly just provide us a lot of information of the galactic region in general. And so like depending on the energies that we receive, then it'll just provide us with just like the knowledge of what events could potentially be happening there. And that's at least that's what I care. And I feel like that's just what that's important, but also just provide us with just this new Dr. Salome actually brought this to my attention with like my fourth reason, which was with the the reason why my flux is potentially lower is because of it, neutrinos might not be, be might be being stopped and interacting with other mat material that we actually don't know of. And so it's just something that we just didn't expect. And so that's just a cool future study that could potentially happen. So a lot could happen from this study. It's just this was a good first attempt at getting this number. Did I hope that I answered your question? <laughs> Thank you, Asia. Thank you.
Asia is another first time presenter. And we are also excited to recognize her mentor, Dr. Nick Salome. If you could, if you don't mind coming up here and take a picture. <laughs> Dr. Salome uh, also mentored a student last year. He'll be presenting in the second block. Uh, so definitely stick around to see that. But if 